All right, we're going to recap that and we're going to do a very short worksheet on binary and hex. So the way that works is if you have a number like this and you want to translate that into a decimal, a base 10 number, and you don't want your keyboard to wobble the whole time, that'll work. Then each of these is a power. Just like if you have the number 349, this is 10 to the power of 0, which is just 10. This is 10 to the power of 1, which is, excuse me, 10 to the power of 0 is just 1. 10 to the power of 1 is 10. 10 to the power of 2 is 100. So the long form expression of this would be 3 times 100 plus 4 times 10 plus 9, which miraculously equals 349. We convert it from base 10 to base 10. We're going to do the same thing with, with this number, except let's shorten it just a little. If we have this, this is 2 to the power of 0, which is 1. This is 2 to the power of 1, which is 2. This is 2 to the power of 2, which is 4. 8 and 16. So that's the 16th place. That's the 8th place. That's the 4th place. That's the 2th place. And that's the 1s. Forgive me for not putting 2 to the power of 0, 2 to the power of 1, 2 to the power of 2, 2 to the power of 3, and 2 to the power of 4. There. So this is equal to 16 plus 8 or I should say 1 times 16, plus 1 times 8, plus how many 4s do we have? 0 4s, zero plus 1 times 2, plus 1, which if we shortened it is equal to 16 plus 8, plus, wait, how many 1s do we have? I goofed up there, that's 0 1s. So there we go, we have 16 plus 8 plus 2, so that's equal to 26 in decimal. So go refresh your Dropbox and we'll see a worksheet. Good. Are we recording? I see a little bit of green. Yeah, the speaker. Something. Okay. So we go to the Dropbox. If you look at in class two, there's a Word doc there. So we're going to convert from binary to decimal in the same style. Show some work. Don't just go look up the values on a table and fill in the values. Here we're only using four digits. So that's not too hard. So if we have the number 1011, that means 1 times 8 plus 0 times 4 plus 1 times 2 plus 1 times 1. So what's this one? That's 0 times 8. I'm just going to skip that. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to even type that. But it's got how many fours? One times four. And how many twos? One times two. So that's equal to six. Following the same motif, go ahead and fill in the last three blanks. We don't have that. Uh, the work document's not connected no. to the drop yeah. That would be a problem. Ten points from Gryffindor. Let's see here. Now it's there. Refresh the Dropbox. I apologize for that.
Everybody got that now? So the first page of this document is the actual worksheet and the rest of it's the lecture that goes along with it. I think we've already done a significant amount of this lecture. We're going to do the hexadecimal part and then we'll go back in and do homework part B. I went ahead and filled in the last ones. Hopefully y'all had already done them before I did that. I kind of uh, shortened the notation. I didn't put the one times in front of them. That's okay. I don't care if you do it like this, where you make it all explicit. Or whether you just put the values of the digits. So if we had a series of binary digits and we wanted to be able to translate them into something easier for humans to read, we could translate them into decimal numbers. We might break them up into groups of three, we might break them up into groups of four. If Normally, they're broken up into groups of four. I'm going to skip breaking them up into groups of three. So, conceptually, I'm going to break them up like that. And now, to make things easier, I'm going to make a little chart down here so I don't have to do them all in my head. should be eight of those boys. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So what is all zeros? That's a zero. What is this equal to? One. Well, yep, that's a one. What? That's a two. Three. Yep, we got that. We got the pattern real easy, huh? But you also know why. Not just that we're counting up by ones, but you know that that's a, you know, a one plus a two plus a, a four is a seven. Now I'm going to go over here and do the same thing, but starting with the ones in front, the eighths place filled in. So that's an eight. Nine. We've got. Eight plus a one, so that's a nine. And then we have an eight plus a two, which is a ten. And obviously, just counting them down, that's going to be 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So the largest value that can be stored in four bits is 15. So the largest value that can be stored in one place is two. So if you have one bit, that's two different possible values if, if you're dealing with. If you have two bits, that's four possible different values. All of those. Three bits 
is eight different possible values. Here we've been changing three of them. We've been ignoring the first one and then four bits is 16 different possible values. So we could think about this as being two to the power of one different possible values. Two to the power of two. Two to the power of three which is two times two times two which is eight. And two to the power of four And then the largest value that one bit can hold is a 1. The largest value that two bits could hold would be a 3. The largest value that three bits could hold would be a 7. And the largest value that four bits could hold would be a 15. And so there's a formula for that as well, which is just this number minus 1. So what's the largest value that 8 bits could hold? Well, how many different values would it be? That would be 2 to the power of 8, which, which is 256 if we were going to sit there and hit 2 times 2 times 2. So the largest would be 255. And you get 256 total values because you include 0. 0, 0, you know. And I'm not going to count out 256 different, you know, starting with 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so here we go. We have our, our little table here of 16 different possible values. So what's an 0101? Yeah, that's a 5. But I'm actually going to call it a 0, 5. And you'll see why. What's this? That's a 1. What is that one? That's a 13. What is that one? And lastly, 1011 is 11. Okay, so if we were going to string those together, I should have put a... Why am I leading them with zeros? Because without it, I can't really decide whether that's a, you know, a 501, 3, 5, 11, or whether it's a 5013, 511, you know. So... In order to successfully encode that in an understandable fashion, it would need to look something like that. But we could shorten that. We could use half as many characters to hold this string. I think I have this wrong. And that's if, you know, once we get up to 10, it starts taking two characters to display that data. But we can use hexadecimal, which is where you replace these values, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, with letters to represent them. A, B, C, D, E, and F. Now, why those letters in particular? Just because they're easy to memorize. You know, they could be, uh, you know, T, W, X, Y, Z, you know, whatever, whatever six letters you wanted, but they settled upon A through F. In other languages, Russian, they would be different letters, you know. But anyways, so now we could encode this. This is encoded as decimal. Now we're going to encode the same thing as hex. So again, 0101 is a 5. And that is a 1. What is a 1101 in hexadecimal? It's a 13, which is a D. And what's an 0101? Well, that's a 5. I seem to like 5s. And 1011 is a B. So then if we took the spaces out of that, we would get 51D5B. And you can see that that took half as much space on the screen. And hexadecimal, you don't have to put the zero, it's just a simple value. Well, we were able to not put the zeros because there was no confusion about whether it was a one or a two place value in this case. So if you were going to count in hexadecimal, 
and let's say we had three different places. Then this is 16 to the power of 0, which is just 1. That's the 1's column. This is 16 to the power of 1, the next one, which is 16. And I'm not going to ask you to do this conversion in your head. And this is 16 to the power of 2 in this column. So if you had the number 200 and a b 2 a b and we had to convert that to decimal that would be 2 times 256 plus well what is an a if we go back up here an a is a 10 so that's 256 plus 10 times type somewhere and I'm not sure what. Okay. 10 times 16 and then what's a B? Well it's one more than an A, eh? So that's plus 11 times 1. So that's 512 plus 160 plus 11 which is 67283. Now you ought to be able to do that in your head, but I'm not going to, I mean not in your head. You ought to be able to do that with pencil and paper or whatever, but I'm not going to ask you to do that. You can go the other way as well. You could be given a hexadecimal number and convert them to the bits. Alrighty, somebody probably knows how to do this. If I want to find the IP address of my machine. IP is it IP config? Thank you. Alright. This one's IP address is 1050249. I think I'll skip that. These are clusters of values, just like the other ones. These are clusters of 8-bit values, and we could convert this to binary, and we could convert this to hexadecimal if we so chose. Why not? This is just for funsies. I want to take this number and convert them to the binary numbers. Now they're larger than the values of 0 through 15, so I'm going to cheat a little bit. But we do know what a 10 is. A 10 is a 1010, so, but we're dealing with 8 bit numbers, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 0, 1, 0. And a 50, well, that's a little bit larger. I'm going to totally cheat and just use Google to tell me the answer. So I'm going to type 50 in binary is. And here we go. Notice that when Google gives me the answer, it prefaces it with 0B. That means binary. Okay. So it's those digits. But I want to make them 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Same thing for 200. We could work that out in our, uh, in our little brains, but I'm not going to. 100 in binary. Oh, it was 200, wasn't it? Okay. There we go. It's 11001000. I don't know why I'm going to this trouble, except I want us to then turn around and encode this in hexadecimal. And then lastly, 49. Is 11001. So I want that to be eight digits long, so I'll tack on two more. Two, three, four. That's how IP addresses are stored. The largest value in any component of an IP address is 255, which is an 8-bit number. OK, now that I have this cute binary string, I want to encode that in hex. Now to encode it in hex, I want to use this table again. But I would break it into groups of four because these hexadecimal digits are in clusters of four. So, 
So all zeros is a zero. And what's one zero one zero? I heard somebody say it. It's a a. What's that one? Three, two. What's that one? That's a twelve, which is a C. That's an eight. Three and then a one. Okay. So encoded if properly encoded in the hexadecimal that removing the spaces. That's what the IP address would look like. Or if we wanted to separate it, you know, with dots like they do when they're displayed. The dots are just for our benefit. There we go. So that's the answer. That's what's known as an IP4 IP address. And the world is running out of IP4 addresses. And so eventually there's going to have to be a massive push to get all the machines up running IP6 because there are astronomically more IP6 addresses because it's like four times as long as this, you know, so it can hold far more number of addresses. How many IP4 addresses are there? Four billion different IP4 addresses. Now that sounds like a lot. It certainly sounded like a lot, you know, in the early 80s when there were maybe a hundred machines on the internet. Now there are a lot more machines on the internet, you know. So, and s s some blocks of them are reserved for special uses. So anyways, this is pr pretty much, the IP4 address, uh, address space is pretty much ma uh, maxed out and people do a lot of tricks and orderly. You know, the internet is now officially too big. As IP addresses run out, eh, yeah, you could go read an article about it, how they're handling that. Okay, so if we go back to our Word document, wait, one more thing we're going to do is we're going to work backwards and convert a hexadecimal sequence to binary. So going back to my notepad, I said back to my notepad. Why do I have two notes going? Okay, suppose we have the word bead one, two, three, four, and we want to convert those to bits. Well, a B is a 1011. We're converting them to bits, you're correct. And then an E, I'm going to put a space there just to make them easier to track. 1110. And an A is a 1010. And a D, is a 1101 and so on. And then so the uh, one is a that and a two is a that. No. And a three is a that and a four is a like that. Okay. So now we've seen how to convert a string of binary into hex. And we've seen how to convert a string of hex to binary. And if you have this table, it goes lickety split. If I give you a quiz, or throw this on the first exam or something like that, I will give you this table so that, you know, you don't have to think too hard about it. That just say, saves you from having to, you know, whip out pen and paints or <clears throat> paper or notepad and recreating this table yourself. So go to the Word document. That's the next part. Go to homework part B. Convert the following binary sequence to hex. There's one, two, three, four, five, six digits here. The first and the last one have been done. Let me pop open the binary table so that we have that on screen. Sorry guys. So what is an 0110? Yeah, so I'm going to go into my homework part B and fill in a 6 there. And what's a 1110? 14, which is an E. Okay, correct. So just fill in the rest of those places. And then on the next one, you do it the other way. Given the letter, the digit, the hexadecimal digit, 
fill in a series of bits that matches. Do you have to know how to do all this in order to be a programmer? Not really, but this is just kind of common underpinnings of computers, like you saw that IP address, you know, why is a maximum number 255? Because each chunk of an IP address is an 8-bit number. And I think we said that 8 bits makes a byte. So an IP con uh, address consists of four 8-bit chunks, so each IP address is four bytes long. And you may have to write a program that will be able to convert or extract bits from a series of data. For example, if you have a, uh, a TCP header, your, your router catches a TCP header and you're tasked with trying to figure out what's what. If you look at it, you see that the first 16 bits, the first two bytes of it, are the port number that the uh, <coughs> byte came from, that the packet came from. And then the last 16 bits of that part is the destination port number. What's a port number? Well, that's beyond this class, but every uh, IP connection you make on your machine has a port number on your side, and then it has a port number on the server that it's talking to. So does anybody remember the command that'll tell you a list of all current open ports? We'll find out. Netstat. Okay. So if you go to a command prompt and type netstat, you can see every internet connection that your machine currently has open. And you'd be surprised. You know, you'd think, I'm not doing anything on the net. Why does it have all these connections? Well, <laughs> good question. This is saying that locally, this is my address locally. And on the server that I'm connected to, this is the address. Almost all of these seem to be HTTP connections. Anyways, okay. So each one of these is a byte. If we look at this, the port number is obviously larger than a byte. Probably two bytes. Two bytes could hold up a number between 0 and 65536, 65,000, something like that. All right, so that is the end of that specific little worksheet. You can go ahead and save that and upload it to that Dropbox. And then the next thing I'm going to do is go to content, textbook, and follow the link to how to think like a computer scientist. The goal of the book is to teach you to think like a computer scientist. The way of thinking combines some of the best features of mathematics, engineering, and natural science. Now, when you become a programmer, you, s you work in layers. There's low layers, there's bits, 
and then there's higher layers, and then there's higher layers, and then there's higher layers still. And it's been said that software engineers, you know, think on a larger scale of layers, you know, than even physicists, you know, where you go from atoms and subatomic particles to molecules to the forces that act upon the, the structures, that there's more layers involved. And does that seem silly? Well, maybe, but your machine is establishing a connection to a network card, which is establishing a connection to a server, which is establishing a connection, you know, to another router out in the internet, and which, you know, so, you know, all those different layers. The Python programming language, that's the language that we're going to learn. It's known as a high-level language. There are other high-level languages, like C++ and Java, and some other ones, or many, many other ones, actually. A high-level language is one that has to be compiled into machine language before it'll run. Now, Python does that for us. We don't actually run a compiler. If you take a C++ class, then after you write some source code, you press a button that turns it into an executable file, a .exe. That's the .exe file has got the machine language in it. And if we go and we look at some particular, I'll tell you what, X ed dot it. This is a site, hex ed dot it, where you can upload a file and you can look at the individual bytes that make that file up. So, for example, if I download a picture, I'm just going to save this picture right here. Save it to my desktop. Then I'm going <coughs> to upload that into hex edit. There we go. We load it up. We can see each individual byte. Since a byte is 8 bits rather than 4, it takes two hexadecimal numbers to display that byte. Now every file type probably has some kind of header which indicates what kind of file that is and how it is encoded. Unless it's a pure text file. A pure text file won't have a little bit of a header. So anyways, the digits FF, D8, FF, DB probably indicates that it's a JPEG file. We could go up and we could look JPEG, header, and find out some information about how they are encoded. The first bit is, or the first bytes are FFDA. If you ever open a file that starts with an FFDA, you know it's a JPEG image. Anyways, an executable is similarly encoded in something unreadable like this. So I'm going to open a file, go out to my system directory or program files, just pick one at random. There's Chrome. If we load up Chrome, this is what Chrome looks like, and I'm sorry that I can't really zoom it in. But we can see that it's not readable. Yeah, there are a few chunks, strings. This program cannot run in DOS mode. Well, programs haven't been written to run in DOS mode since you know, 1992 or whatever, so that's not real surprising. But anyways, machine code is what drives that processor. We don't write in this kind of stuff. We write in a high-level language, which looks like English and has you know, algebraic expressions, numbers and equal signs and stuff like that. So almost all programs are written in high-level languages because they're easier to read. So they take less time to write. And since they're easier to read, you can write larger projects more quickly. So you can bet that nobody wrote Call of Duty using us, um, you know, zeros and ones or you know, bytes of machine code. Instead, they wrote it in a high-level language, probably C++. So programs that are written in a high-level language have to be translated into something more suitable before they run. If it's a scripting language, it's not translated into machine code until you actually run it on your machine. So if I lo load up Python or if I load up idle and then use the uh, Python shell, la -dee -da -dee -da. and so if I type a is equal to 5, 
and then I say print A and it fails miserably. I always do this. I made that an uppercase A and I made this a lowercase A. Your variable names have to match exactly even up to their case. So print A. There we go. It printed out 5. This statement written in an English-like form had to be turned in to, uh, to machine language before it could actually run. A script language does that at runtime, whereas a programming language like C++ gets compiled into an executable and then you get to run the executable. And all the apps that you download to your phones or your, tabs or your tablets have already been compiled for the most part. So that's why Python is known as a scripting language, is that it's not a compiled language. It doesn't turn into the bits and bytes until you actually load it up and run it. JavaScript is the same way. If I go to a some web page, what well, heck, how about Google right here, and then I do view page source, this looks horrible, but this is actually a programming language known as JavaScript. And if it was formatted, you know, with white space, so we're, we could actually read it, we could actually kind of understand what it's doing. Again, this is downloaded just when the web page comes. And then it gets interpreted into the machine language at runtime by the browser. And there could be typos in it. You remember back in the olden days, you were using a browser, and you might see a little pop-up window at the bottom that said JavaScript error. Nowadays, the uh, browsers don't even tell you that there's an error. You know, they just don't because that would stress you out. You know, so, so they skip the fact that there's an error. But that's a scripting language. A scripting language is one that is interpreted at runtime. When we launch a idle or we launch Python, we get what's known as the Python in shell, which is also called in this text the immediate mode, meaning that you can type things into it and you get immediate responses. If you want to find out what 2 plus 3 is, you type in 2 plus 3, it gives you 5. So that's immediate mode or the Python shell. Usually I'll call it the shell. Along with the shell, there's a script mode. The script mode is where you open up a program and you type it in. Well, that's a big program. And then you run it. And it blows up because that command is in Java, not Python. That's pretty, pretty ignorant. I'm not sure why I had that. There we go. I think this is the program that we did last week, an interest calculator. And so we see that it's a whole bunch of lines. You know, it's a dozen or two or three dozen lines of code which gets executed all at once when I run it. And then if I come back up here and I look, I can see that it runs it. It says restart. It gives a path to our file. And since it's running in script mode, then those statements are turned into machine language and it runs them each line one after the other. We could type this silly program in line by line into script mode. I'm going to close the script and reopen it. Now that I've closed the script, if I want to get a new shell, I can just choose run Python shell and I get a brand new shell because I closed the other one. I could type the same thing here into immediate mode. Year is equal to 1970. Speed is equal to 1000. Molt is equal to 2. Per is equal to 2. If I make a typo, it's a really a drag. While year is less than or equal to 2016 colon Notice it didn't put the arrows up this time. Print year comma speed year is equal to year plus per speed is equal to speed times mult. Now I stop indenting and then it does that. That's immediate mode. Why would you not do your programming in that? Because what if I made a mistake in that print statement? I had spelled it primped with an M. Well, I'm out of luck. I can't just go back up there and edit this. Instead, I have to type this entire four-line command in again and correct it and hope that I got it. So it's far more efficient just to save this stuff as a file, as a script, and then run it. And by the way, if you're on a machine that doesn't have Python installed on it and you can't install Python on it, there are online Python installations you can use. I had somebody tell me they're using a Chromebook and they can't install Python 3 on it. So I directed them to, let me find the website. 
This is if you get really bored and want to play with Python while you're out and about and you want to do it on your phone or your tablet. Okay, R-E-P-L dot I-T. I don't know what that means, R-E-P-L dot I-T. If I go to R-E-P-L dot I-T, I can start coding in different languages, including Python and Ruby and even C Sharp and Java. And then I get a little window here, and I can type that program in and run it. Year is equal to 1980, you know. Pop is equal to 3. X is equal to year times pop. Print X, whatever, you know. And then when I run it, I see the output over here. So that's kind of cool. I still want you to install Python on your own home machine if you possibly can, rather than rely on this. But if you had to, you could do that. And the reason for that is we're going to be using some things that would not be available here. in dr Graphics drawing libraries that aren't supported on the, uh, the online version of Python like this. So what is a program? It's a sequence of instructions that specifies how to perform a calculation, a computation. Now the computation can be extraordinarily simple, like here's one that just adds two numbers, or it can be extraordinarily complicated, like a game, or the, the program Word, you know, something that is millions and millions of lines long. Debugging. Debugging is when there's a problem in your code and you have to figure out what kind of problem it is and how to fix it. There's broadly three different kinds of problem of bugs that you can hit. There are syntax errors, there are runtime errors, and there are semantic errors. A syntax error is something that just stops the program from running because there's a typo. And I'll give you an example of that. I'm going to go back to this program and say I misspelled the word year. Let's say that I called it year. When I try to run the program, Let me close the window and rerun it again so that the text is up at the top of the screen. Boom. It says year is not defined. That is a syntax error. Or what if I typed in, what if everything was spelled correctly, but I made some other problem, like I forgot to put my colon. In the Python language, each new code block of indented code has to start with a colon. If it finds a new level of indention without a colon, it doesn't work gives me an error, invalid syntax. It's trying to be polite and even tell me where the error is, so it, it highlight that error. That's a syntax error. The program won't run at all. Then there are other kinds of errors. The next kind is what's known as a runtime error. A runtime error is when the program runs, but it stops running under certain conditions. And if you've ever run a program and it says program is executed in error, Windows will kill the program, you know, or you get a blue screen of death or something like that, that is a runtime error. And here's an example. I'm going to say that year is equal to year plus per divided by zero. That's really dumb, but let's do it. And it says zero division error, division by zero. That's not a syntax error. This is valid syntax, but it's doing something wrong. You can't divide by zero. And you, you may have all seen these funny looking memes. Divide by zero. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just one more thing, not recommended to be done without supervision by Chuck Norris. No. Whatever. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Bad language. Anyways, stop dividing by zero. Okay, you know, that's just because the program will crash if it doesn't catch that error. That's a runtime error when your program crashes, when your program stops. It's different from a syntax error. The syntax error stops it from running to begin with. There are all sorts of runtime errors. What if you're trying to write to a file? And you're trying to write to, you know, a floppy disk, a colon backslash, but you didn't put the disk in. Well, it can't write to that file. 
it'll generate some kind of runtime error. And if the program is well written, it'll give you a chance, you know, to say could not open file, and it'll give you a chance to pick another file to write to. And then the last kind is a semantic error. A semantic error, you know, you've heard that's a matter of semantics or whatever. A semantic error is when the program is running and it's doing exactly what you told it to do, but what you told it to do is wrong. You know, computers do exactly what you tell it to do, even if what you tell it to do is wrong. So suppose we wrote a program, excuse me, and I wanted it to tell me whether some water was freezing or not. So I said temperature is equal to 70 degrees. And then I had the line of code, if temperature is less than 212 colon print boiling, because 212 is the boiling point of water, else colon print not boiling. So when I run the program, it's going to print one of those two things, either boiling or not boiling. boiling. It's printed boiling. Now, is water at 70 degrees really boiling? No, it's not. I goofed. I should have made that greater than 212 rather than less than 212. So the program did exactly what I said, but it didn't do what I mean. I have to have to fix that. That's a semantic error. A semantic error is an error in the logic of the program, so it does the wrong thing. It doesn't blow up. It doesn't generate a, an error you know, and stop running, but it gives you the wrong output. capable of reading by yourself, so I'm not going to cover every single bullet point in the chapter one. So the first program, and we've already done this. Traditionally, the first program is a print statement. Print, hello world. So we could type that into a script or even the shell, and then when we ran it, it would say hello world. This is a function. A function is something that's followed by parentheses. And within the parentheses, there may be some data that data is known as the argument. Some people call it the parameter. Parameter and arguments have very similar definitions. When you're looking at the function call and what is being passed in, that's when you call it an argument. This is the argument to the print function. It, instru it instructs the print function what to do, which is to display the words hello world. So the syntax for a function call in Python, as well as many other languages, is the name of the function round parentheses, not square braces or whatever, and then inside the parentheses there may be arguments. If there's not, it'll just be empty parentheses with nothing between them. And it could have a hundred arguments, in which case you would separate them all with commas. So print I love arguments. So, you know, this one had three arguments. The print function is written in a special way so that it can take a variable number of arguments. Most functions can only take one argument. I'm going to define my own function. I'm going to call it Fred, like Fred Flintstone. All it does is take one argument. It prints that value, and then it prints yabba dabba -doo. Then when I want to call Fred, since the function was defined to take one argument, that's all I can pass to it. If I try to call the function without any arguments, I don't put anything between the parentheses, it gives me an error. If I try to call the function with too many arguments, like hello, comma, there. It also gives me an error. I define that function to take one argument. That's what it has to have. Now that argument, since it's a string, could be a, you know, a whole bunch of different things, but still, it takes one argument. So, uh, quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, so would it matter because you put, um, you put like 
I love arguments. You put them all in different. Uh, so I didn't know if, like, if you go back to it. I'll yeah, to yeah I'm going to try to go back to that one. Okay, like up, up there we put I love arguments. Uh huh. Let's play with that. There's different ways we could try it, and let's see. You know, would that work? No. Would this work? No. And the reason these don't work is that this is text. This is a string. The computer doesn't know what the English language is. So, in order to get that successfully to print, I have to surround it in quotes. And the only reason I put three separate quotes separated by commas was to illustrate that you could pass more than one argument. This is one argument even though it consists of a string with three words in it. It's still one item. So it'll print just as if you had multiple arguments because that's the same, like the other one says I love arguments, so does that one. Right, right. So I could say like x is equal to 100 and then I could say print x equals if I could type comma x this is the string so it prints that string and this is the variable so it prints 100 there does that make sense okay cool I love questions thank you very much comments we've talked about comments I think comments are the things that start with a hash symbol and pound sign some people call it before they started calling it hashtags. It's ignored by the computer and it's just for the humans to read. And we had a couple of those the other day. There are some comments. Then I put some comments here. So what you use comments for is to identify the program up at the top. You put a block of comments you know, with your name and your date and what the assignment is or whatever you're working on. And then you can comment individual parts of it like I might want to put that this is the you know get input from user section and then down here I might want to put calculate and display results now these are pretty generic comments but that's the idea and the reason you use comments is if you're writing programs that are thousands upon thousands of lines long and then you come back and you look at it six months later or worse, six years later, you're not going to have any recollection of what the program is doing and how it's doing. But if there are English comments in it, then you can pretty quickly figure out what it does. So professional programmers do comment their code. You don't have to put a, a comment on every line of code. That just makes it harder to read. But you know, commenting a chunk of code, saying what the code below it does, the next five or ten lines do, is a great idea. Glossary. What is an algorithm? An algorithm is a set of specific steps for solving a problem. There's an algorithm for calculating pi. There's an algorithm for counting a number from one value to another. It's just a recipe that the computer follows. A bug. It's an error in a program. The term bug actually predates programming. Um, like maybe there was a bug in the system and there was an actual bug caught between two gears. And so if you look up first computer bug, a woman named Grace Hopper in the 40s weren't working on UNIVAC or ENIAC. The computer stopped working and it's because there was a fly stuck between two relays. And so she said, first computer bug, first actual case of a bug being found. But that implies that the term existed before then. But it moved from engineering terms of a physical problem to, you know, being a generic term for a problem in the code. Debugging is the process of finding and removing the bugs. What is a comment? It's information in a program that's meant for the programmers. It has no effect on the execution of the program. You could type in, I hate Python, stop now. And you put it inside the comments, it's not going to do anything. Exception is another name for a runtime error. I don't really care if you remember that word exception right now. But I do want you to remember the three kinds of errors. A f nah, 
we didn't we skipped that chunk. A high level language is one that's designed to be easy for humans to read and write. Immediate mode is when you go into the Python shell, type things in and it executes immediately, rather than script mode where you write a whole bunch of lines and then you run it all at once. The interpreter is what turns the English-like command, like the word print, into the machine code, the zeros and the ones that actually make the chip do something. A low-level language is designed for computers to execute, machine language. It's not easy for us to read. This is a fairly important term. A program is considered portable if it will run on more than one kind of computer. And Python is a portable language. If you write a Python program, it will run on your Mac or your Linux or your Windows or, you know, on your Android phone or whatever has Python installed on it. A program is considered non-portable if it only runs on one specific kind of computer. For example, an Xcode program, you can't get that to work very easily on your PlayStation. It's a non-portable program. Why do people write non-portable programs? To maximize the uh, utilization, you know, to get the best out of the system, to make the program run as fast as possible, you know, to use all the graphics capabilities of it or whatever. Yes, sir? Well, portable only implies or dictates to how the program is written, not where it's stored. Because you can run programs that are stored on another person's computer, you know, if you establish a network connection and map drives or whatever. That doesn't make it portable. Portable is, you know, if I mapped my Macintosh and my PC together and I tried to run the Mac program on my PC, it's not going to work because it's a non-portable program. So Python shell, an interactive user interface to the Python interpreter. This is the shell. I ought to just be able to type Python here. Or I load up idle. I can type commands in directly. A is equal to 10. Print A times A plus 2. It interprets it in the machine code. And it does the, you know, the manipulations to call, you know, to tell the chip, to tell everything what happens in order to display that. All right, that's about enough for today. I wasn't clever enough to come up with homework to send you all home with, so uh, I will see you all on Wednesday. Do upload that, uh, that worksheet.